guys, <clears throat> this is going to be my, uh, this is going to be kind of a, a survey of the options for compact 35mm cameras. Um, let's start with the Nikon One Touch L35AF3. So this is the third generation. Generally the first generation is the most desirable because it has a five element lens and the second and third generation only have a four element lens. However, I can assure you that the four element lens is well corrected, it's sharp all the way across the frame, contrasty, uh, and it's multi-coated. And the second generation skipped the, the filter thread, so you couldn't really, uh, you couldn't put a filter in there and the light metering was somewhere else. This one has the, the light metering in, inside the filter thread, so that's kind of a nice feature. Uh, this one has a 35mm 2.8 lens. 35mm uh, is my favorite uh, focal length. Let me zoom in here for you a little bit. <clears throat> um, so that's a, one positive thing. It's an excellent lens. Uh, it is motor driven, but it's pretty quiet if you know how to use it. So it's half press to focus, full press to take the picture, and it only winds on after you release the button, the, the shutter release button. So what you do if you want to be quiet, you take the picture and you hold the button in and you put the camera down, you walk away, hide it in your jacket, whatever, and then let off the shutter release and it and then it winds whenever you're ready for it too. Uh, this was the first camera that had a half press of the shutter release to lock autofocus and exposure. So that's a handy feature. Um, kind of a I consider it kind of a pro feature for point and shoot cameras, although it became the standard uh, after that. The viewfinder is great. Uh, you can use it even with glasses pretty easily. Uh, my grandpa had this camera in the middle 80s or late 80s. And he had trifocals and he used it with no problem. It has an electronic self timer. All you have to do is just push up on this and then the light comes on and then after 10 seconds or so, 8 seconds it starts blinking and then takes the picture. And it just did that because there's no film in it, it's trying to wind. Uh, one negative side to this is that it's not that small. So it's a point and shoot camera, um, fit it in a jacket pocket if you need to, but let's not push it and call it compact. We'll do a size comparison later. Uh, but it fits in the hand pretty nicely, it's got a nice grip, um, it's got this nice traction, tractioned area here for your thumb. Uh, the construction's very solid. Um, this is a nice feature here, the, the flash cancel button. So flash is automatic and when you half press the shutter button, uh, the red LED will come on in the viewfinder if it's going to fire flash. If you don't want that to happen, you release that, hold down the flash cancel button, and then take the picture and it won't use the flash. So that's nice, uh, pretty intuitive. Um, the construction is, is very good overall. It's much better constructed than the than the first generation one, especially with regards to the battery door. Um, this one, you have to use a, a ballpoint pen to push a latch, and then, then you slide the door open, but it's a very solid door. It's a 2CR5 lithium battery in here, which is, um, you can still find them pretty easily. They're between six and $10, uh, but they last, about 30 rolls of film using flash about half the time, if I recall correctly. So it is it is expensive and you do have to order one online unless you have a local camera store, but they last a long time and since it's lithium it never leaks. So you find these all the time without jacked up battery compartments like you do a lot of the cameras that use AA batteries. Uh, the lens cover is pretty good, it's just a built in two bladed one, pretty solid. Uh, another cool thing about this is when you get to the end of the roll, you'll hear it kind of lock up a little bit, and then it rewinds the roll automatically, but it leaves about an inch to a half an inch of the film tip out. So that's, again, a nice photographer-friendly feature. So that's the, the one-touch third generation, L35 AF3. Pretty great camera all around. I think if I was only going to have one point-and-shoot camera, it probably would be this one. All right. Move on now to the Olympus Mu. Um, you can see this is a Mu, so someone bought this in overseas somewhere, Canada or Europe or whatever. Normally in uh, 
in the USA, they're called the stylus, uh, the infinity stylus. This is just called the Mew. So cool things about this one, it's tiny um, compared to, for example, the L35AF. You can see it's just diminutive uh, in height also. Thickness for the most part. Overall, they're probably close to the same thickness, but this one just has kind of a nice curved shape. And while we're talking about the shape, one thing I like about it is that it's really it's small in pocket size, but it also it doesn't totally ignore ergonomics. So you can, you know, for example, it has this little wave here, and your thumb just fits nicely there. And um, there's a little dent in the in the clamshell cover that just makes it easy to grab and slide that open. And then there's another little dent here where you can put your off fingers. So even though it's tiny, it's it's still pretty ergonomic to use. Uh, the design is just elegant. I think it's classic. Uh, some some people will disagree with me, but I think it's more elegant than the uh, the Mew 2 or the Stylus Epic, as it's also called. Uh, that one fits in the pocket better. It doesn't have this protruding lip here or this protruding lip here or this protruding lip here. So it slides in and out of pockets, but it's um, it's not as easy to hold on to as this one. Um, let's see what else. The lens is a 35 3.5, so it's not as fast. It's a half a stop slower than the um, than some of the other most of the other cameras here, and it's a triplet. It's only a three element instead of a four or five element like all the other cameras here. So, but it's a it's a good triplet. But the best triplets can still not be uh, corrected that well on the edges unless maybe they're a spherical. This is just a regular old fashioned, um, but it is a good one. So. Probably the the center of the center of the frame, probably eighty percent of it is nice and sharp, and then it gets a little less sharp towards the corners. Of all these cameras here too, this is the only one that doesn't have uh, any problems without having to have a CLA, and it's been used pretty hard, I can tell. So it's pretty sturdy. It uses CR one twenty three lithium, which are easy to find and cheap, maybe like six bucks or so. And again, that'll go a lot of rolls, and it charges the, the flash quickly, and it doesn't leak. So, good little camera. This is my choice for uh, something I just throw in a camera bag and take it with me every day wherever I go. Love this view. Okay, next is one that's uh, near and dear to me, the Roli 35. Um, and I've never had one of these that didn't need a CLA first. If you get one that doesn't need a CLA, expect to pay over $200 for it. Cool things about this, it's the original full-frame compact camera. came out in, it was either 64 or 66. And this is also not a very fast lens. It's a 40 millimeter 3.5. But it, it's a collapsible design, so it doesn't vignette like the, um, like the Mew does. The Mew has the, you have a little light fall off, noticeable light fall off in the corners. This one doesn't. When you look at the pictures from this, as long as you nail your focus, they look like SLR pictures. It is so sharp. It's only a four element lens, but that fourth element means that it can be corrected across the field. So, uh, really good. Uh, it's also fully manual, so you got a shutter speed dial here. And the way this works is when you're setting this up to take a shot, you hold it at waist level, you got the meter here, your shutter speed here from a 500th down to half a second plus bulb. Speaking of bulb, there's a, the shutter release button is threaded. So if you wanted to actually take serious pictures with this with a cable release on a tripod, you could. And then the aperture dial is here. You push this release here and then you dial the aperture you want. You can see that moves the, the red needle on the, the light meter. and also the shutter speed does the same thing. It's not a range finder or an autofocus, it's a scale focus. So you look at the scale, there's a depth of field scale here that's quite usable, and uh, American ones, ones made for the American market, will have feet on the top. Closest focusing is three feet to infinity. On the bottom, you have meters. So the lens is just outstanding. That's the main thing. Is And since it telescopes out, it's far enough away from the, the film plane 
where it can cover the whole frame without vignetting on the sides and it's just sharp corner to corner it's just excellent I can't really overstate that uh, but what I was getting at anyway with adjusting at the waist level you do have to set your exposure manually and you have to you have to guess the focus and it's not too bad it's not as bad as you might think because if you're using if it's a bright day or you're using fast film you're going to be on the higher apertures anyway and then you have a pretty big you have a pretty big leeway uh, you can also do the hyperfocal trick uh, you can read more about that somewhere else uh, the viewfinder another cool thing about this the the 35 and the uh, 35s have the viewfinder all the way at the left of the camera so if you're right eye dominant what that means is that it's just it's very comfortable to use because your nose goes off to the side of the camera you don't have to turn your head sideways to use it uh, it doesn't feel admittedly it doesn't feel as good to grip as uh, some of the bigger cameras here because it has the the shutter speed and the aperture dials on the front now they did make three element lens models with the with the triatar lens that had uh, all the adjustments concentric to the lens uh, and that looks better and it feels a little bit better but those were just very cheaply made on the inside I wouldn't recommend those unless it's just for uh, a collector's standpoint uh, from a tactile point of view this is the most satisfying one to use it's just everything is just really nice the way it works I had this one CLA because it I couldn't get the aperture to, to open or close all the way it turned out it had taken a hit and something was bent in there uh, I had a, a 35S before and um, great, it had the great sonar lens but I think it was jacked up too because I never could get anything sharp inside of 10 feet Maybe I was just bad at guessing distance in those days, but it was consistently bad, so I don't think that's it. Uh, something people do complain about is the hot shoe being on the bottom of the camera. So what that means is if you want to take a people picture with a flash without having these nasty looking shadows projecting up on their face, you have to turn the camera upside down, and then you fire the shutter with your left thumb, and you compose with your left eye instead of your right. Or you can turn your head to the side. So that's a little awkward. And then the whole bottom comes off like a Nikon F. They really did a good job cramming everything in here. So I think that's that might be my favorite of the bunch, but uh, if I could only have one, probably this would be it, the Roll I-35. But let's move on. Pentax PC-35 AF. This is one that I learned about from uh, David Mahali and from... Mike Gutterman also mentioned it, but this, I kind of saw this as kind of an in-between camera. So this came out in 82, three years after the Olympus XA came out, and it has some improvements like autofocus, but it keeps a lot of the, the nice things about the XA, which is manual film advance and rewinding. So you don't waste, you don't have, need to take a bunch of room for uh, batteries and a motor drive that could be used for something else. This one just uses a couple of AAA batteries for the flash and for the light meter and for the autofocus. And this one has kind of a switchblade opening. You just push that down, it pops it open, shows you the, the five element 35 millimeter 2.8 Pentax lens. This lens is just excellent. Uh, it's probably as good as the Roll I-35 lens, but since it's a little too close to the film plane, it's not quite as well corrected across the field and it vignettes just a little bit at the corners. And then you pop the fl when you want to use the flash, that's also a switchblade arrangement there. This is nice because it's the flash is much further away from the lens than on something like the stylus or the mu, so you're not going to get as much red eye that you'll have to correct later. So perfect mix of auto and manual in my opinion. Uh, one downside is that the film speed only goes between 25 and 400. So you set it manually and it's auto exposure so you can't really change anything except to over, you, you can overexpose by a stop and a half for backlighting. So that's kind of a drawback that it only goes to 400. And also this is the second one of these that I bought from eBay that the seller described as fully functional and it's not fully functional 
uh, the flash doesn't work, the autofocus doesn't uh, doesn't seem to work, the light meter doesn't work. So I'm debating if I should send this uh, send this back or if I should have it CLA'd because I like the lens so much and I like the aesthetics of it so much. Speaking of that, this is kind of an interesting thing. The the film advances on the right side, but the take up is on the left side. So it's got some kind of a linkage in there from here to there. They should have just put the film advance over here, I think, but that's all right. I'm not a Pentax designer. It looks like it's plastic fantastic, but it's actually not. Uh, the clamshell cover is plastic, but the body is, is metal and the back is metal. So it's kind of a hybrid. Anyway, and this one also, the viewfinder is a little small, but it's also very clear. Uh, this has the one and a half plus one and a half backlight compensation like the XA does. It's a little bit better placed on this camera with a top button instead of a little lever on the bottom. Yeah, so I don't know. Don't hold your breath on finding working one of these unless you plan on having it CLA'd too. I almost recommend one, recommend buying one that doesn't work, you know, for 20 or 30 bucks and then spend your 100 or 150 getting it CLA'd to have a good one. So, Pentax PC 35 AF. Excellent lens, nice feature set. <clears throat> Moving on, Olympus 35 RC. This one, I really like this one. If I had to pick between this and the Roll i35, it would be hard to pick. Um, this one is a little bit bigger in every dimension except thickness. They're both equally thick. This one's a little wider and a little bit taller, but in exchange for that extra size, you get a conventional camera layout. Some people just can't get over the, um, can't get used to the new ergonomics of the Roll i35. If you're one of those people where you like to have things in the conventional place, this is the one. Um, got the shutter speed dial here, the aperture here around the lens mount, if we can call it a lens mount, because it's a fixed lens. You got range, you know, proper rangefinder focusing if you don't like to guess and also you can shoot manual mechanical or aperture priority auto or in the flash mode let's see if I can get it just to focus in, in the flash mode here it's linked to the guide number that you set for a manual flash so if you have a manual flash you set your guide number here and then when you change the focus it also changes the aperture to match the guide number of the flash if you don't have a, a manual flash, if you have an automatic flash, then just go over to the, the manual mode, set the aperture that your flash guide says, and then you're good to go. And of course, since it's a leaf shutter, you can set any shutter speed and it works at all of them. Okay, so conventional design. The lens is fantastic. It's uh, Olympus Ease Wico. Ease for Edward. No, I'm just kidding. That means uh, that's the fifth letter in the alphabet, so it means it's a five element lens. Very good. I think it might be the same one that's on the Trip 35. But you won't have any complaints. Again, when you look at the pictures, they look like they're SLR quality. It's well corrected. It's, a, it's better corrected than the, uh, the, the point and shoot cameras generally, where they're, the lens is stuck a little too close to the film. It's on par with the Roll i35 for image quality. I'd call them about the same. Maybe just a very slight edge to the 35RC, but that's just more of a guess. I couldn't see it in any of my pictures. It has the smoothest film advance in the group. It's got some kind of a ratcheted linkage that I have not seen on any other kind of camera, but it's even smoother than an SLR. I don't know how they do it. It's low effort. It's very smooth. The viewfinder is a little dinky. Um, it's even smaller than the, than the PC35 AF but it's bigger than the stylus or the uh, Mew. The Mew has a really dinky little viewfinder that's kind of hard to find sometimes. Uh, one bad thing about it, it has an odd filter size. It's, uh, I think it's 43 and a half millimeter and Olympus was the only one that made filters in that size. Mm -hmm. So what people do is they, they find a step up ring, 43 and a half to, to 46 millimeters and then you can get filters for it. And if you lost your original lens cap, you're kind of screwed. So that's kind of a downside. The film speed goes from 
25 up to 800, so that's a good useful range. It doesn't top out at 400 like some of these other cameras. Uh, one other downside is this uh, self-timer lever is plastic, and now this plastic is getting you know, close to 50 years old. You hardly ever see one with that self-timer lever intact. I think probably it's also because people don't know if they should push it up or down. They try to push it up and then they break it. It actually should go down. It has a sensible range of shutter speeds, which I like. Uh, it goes from it goes from bulb to a fifteenth, and then up to one five hundredth of a second. So that's reasonable. If you're well braced, even if you're not supporting the camera on a tripod, if you've got this up to your head and you brace your body in a corner, you can shoot this at a fifteenth of a second and get sharp pictures because the shutter is just so smooth. There's no camera slap or anything, or no mirror slap or anything. So 15th is feasible, 30th is more feasible, and then of course the 60th and above is no problem. I mentioned it has a proper range finder. Uh, another cool thing about it, and I'm not going to be able to show that here, but it's got the shutter speed and the aperture shown in the range finder, or in the viewfinder. So when you set it, it shows you what you have it set to, and when it's in auto, and you half press the shutter release button, a needle comes over and it shows you what aperture it's going to pick. I think that's awfully cool. Um, the hot shoe is on the top, so this is another thing they had to make it in order to make the Roll I 35 smaller. They had to move it to the bottom, and the bottom's detachable, by the way. It comes off to change film. So this has it in the conventional spot, um, and it also has an X Sync jack here. So you actually could do some serious flash photography with this camera if you wanted to. And the film advance uh, or the the film back pops open here. Really solid little camera. It's pretty much what you would expect. And, and I bought it thinking, well, if the light meter doesn't work, then I still have full manual mechanical. Uh, and by the time you pay enough money to get a Trip 35, you can get one of these uh, for maybe just a tad more, and it's a lot more capable camera. Okay. Last but not least, the humble Minolta Freedom 2. Now this is one of those point and shoot cameras. This is one of the first ones that just took all control away from the shooter. All you do is you flip this open here and you push the button. There's no pre-focus. It just focuses on whatever is in the middle and you can't really tell when it's focusing either. So this is for someone, for those people that always put the subject right in the middle. It's just a snap shooter camera. But the reason I mention it in this company is that the lens is just outstanding. It's a, a 35 millimeter, it's either a 3.5 or a 4, so not particularly fast, but it is really sharp. I could not believe how sharp this lens was. It's uh, easily on par with the, with the uh, Nikon lens and, um, and also with the PC35 AF lens. Not quite up to the Roll I35 or the, or the Ezuico on the um, Olympus. A uh, cool little thing about this is that if you look on the bottom here, it's a DX set, so that it's auto here, but if you don't have a DX cartridge, you can turn this little knob and select it between 100 and 400. So not a lot, but you're not, you know, stuck with the default 100 ASA if you don't have DX cartridges. And then you see this little door here. This is kind of interesting. You might notice this camera is a little shorter top to bottom than other cameras because it doesn't have to allow room for the film cartridge to pivot in and have a spring-loaded um, spool on the inside. So what it does is when you pop the back open, this door also pops open to allow room for the film cartridge to go in there without having to have any room or a spring-loaded um, winder. That's kind of a neat thing. It just makes it a little shorter top to bottom. I can't really demonstrate it right now. I got a roll of film in there. It's only got three shots on it. Typical crappy battery door of the 80s point and shoots. Um, all this does is make the connection for the two double A's in here in series. So it's okay just to tape it down if you do find a good one otherwise. So I'm going to do a quick size comparison here. This is about the same thickness as the, as the Nikon but shorter. 
Actually, I think the Nikon is actually the, is the biggest one of this group, even though it's one of the more modern ones. Compared to the Rolli 35, you see it's a lot longer. But it's a fair trade-off because you've got the flash, the 2CR5 lithium battery, and a motor drive. So that's what you're, that's what you're paying for that space with. And the Pentax is a little bit shorter. It's got the flash, but not a motor drive. They sold a motor drive that you can put on separately. And the flash only uses triple A's instead of uh, a 2CR5 or double A's. And then, of course, the Olympus Mu is a lot smaller in every direction. This is a true pocket size camera. Not quite as thin as a Ricoh GR, but it's pretty close, and I think it's a lot more ergonomic to use. And then, just for size comparison, I brought a knicker mat along, so there's a knicker mat FTN. You can see it's an absolute beast compared to the middle size camera, the Olympus 35RC. It's a little bit taller, a lot wider, and then of course with the lens, it's a lot thicker. So these were kind of the pre-point shoots of the 70s. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching. I'll probably think of some things uh, that I didn't think about when I was recording this, and I'll put them in the comments uh, in the, the video notes below. And, of course, if you have comments or questions, post them, and I'll, I'll answer them. And uh, I'll see you guys for the next one.